Erev Tov Rechavia. Good morning in Pittsburgh. Greetings to friends of Israel and today friends of art from around the world. My name is Wayne Firestone. I'm the executive director of the America Israel Friendship League. And boy, do I miss running around a gallery, contemplating, looking at new creations. Uh, for many of us, it's been a long time since we've actually been able to enjoy that experience in person. We're going to be speaking with some people today who haven't stopped creating and who are taking a little bit of time from their own uh, uh, works and and uh, uh, and activities and travels uh, to share with us a little bit with a virtual tour of the Alone Segev Gallery today. Before we begin, I introduce the panelists. I'd love to hear in the chat when was the last time you were in a gallery at a museum enjoying art in person? Where were you? Were you in London? Were you in New York? What part of the world, what museum, what gallery? Give us a little bit of sharing uh, so that we can all experience uh, what it is we're looking forward to and what it is indeed we're gonna be exploring today in, in the virtual sense. So today in our gallery, we uh, are getting to visit really Israel's premier contemporary art gallery, the Alon Segev Gallery. I'm so pleased to have the director of that gallery with us, Amnon Kessel, who helped uh, put together uh, our, our webinar today. Amnon's been the director uh, at Alone Segev Gallery for over 15 years. He lives and works in Tel Aviv, so we're all jealous. And um, interestingly enough, in his background, uh, he comes not initially from the art world, but his training is in microbiology. And I've always been interested in that intersection between science and art. And so Amnon, we, we uh, are so grateful uh, uh, today to have you with us. I'm looking forward very much to hear about what it's like to run a gallery in the middle of a pandemic and how to continue to uh, expose people to art and uh, for art lovers around the world to expose them specifically to Israeli art. Sigalit Landau is a graduate of the world-renowned Bezalel Academy of Art and Design. She's a Yerushalmi, born in Jerusalem originally, but living in Tel Aviv uh, uh, now. Uh, she has uh, her work exhibited around the world at MoMA, at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, KW Institute of Contemporary Art, uh, her art's been seen in Berlin, it's been seen in Venice, it's been seen in Barcelona. Today it will be seen among uh, everyone here in our virtual uh, gallery. We're very much looking forward to that. Um, Gideon Rubin uh, was born in Israel but resides now in London. And as you can tell from his background, he's not in London today. Um, maybe he'll be good enough to reveal uh, this uh, ideal venue, uh, just your your wall is so beautiful. Uh, I, 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 I feel we could already feel a, a little bit of a different part of the Mediterranean with you, Gideon, uh, today. Uh, uh, Gideon's a graduate of the Slade School of Art and has had numerous international exhibits of his work from Sydney to Milan to China, uh, and interestingly enough, and I hope you'll share uh, a little bit about some of your work uh, that has appeared at the Freud Museum in London. So today we have um, Israeli art uh, that has international appeal. And what better place to explore that than with uh, alone, uh, the Alon Segev Gallery. So Amnon, tell us a little bit about the gallery and tell us what it means to have Israeli art that is really appreciated on the, the, the global scale these days. Right, well, hello everybody. Uh, and so, you know, I'm happy to, to be with you and talk to all you guys, uh, although it, it feels a bit weird for me to talk to a screen and not to a, I'm more used to talking to large group of people or to a single person. Um, so uh, it feels a bit awkward, but it's okay. Um, well, I've been in the gallery for many, many years. Uh, I started working here in the year 2002. 
actually during Sigalit Landau's extraordinary solo exhibition, uh, The Country. And coming from a completely different background, uh, after years in the laboratories of the Weizmann Institute and Tel Aviv University, to come into a completely different galaxy. Uh, at the time, it was a large space, two stories below ground. Um, it was a completely different experience for me. Uh, I joined the gallery just for, you know, for a few months between jobs and uh, almost uh, 20 years later, uh, I'm still here. Uh, I'm loving it. I don't miss uh, my previous lives in dark laboratories, uh, completely detached from the world. So I'm very happy to be uh, surrounded in great art, to know interesting people. Artists are well, so much different than what I was used to in, you know, in my science uh, career. But uh, it's different. I love it. And uh, I'm very proud to be part of this uh, world and the gallery. Um, Alon Segev Gallery uh, opened uh, almost 20 years ago uh, as part of a shift in the way galleries or Israeli galleries are built and displayed um, you know, from uh, local galleries, small spaces, um, directly to uh, art spaces, tall ceilings, open spaces, well-lit uh, uh, spaces that uh, provide all that artists and art um, needs. And it felt like, you know, stepping into a gallery in New York or Paris or London, everything was different. It was really uh, a pleasure. I'm, I'm still enjoying it uh, today. Um, we in the gallery, uh, uh, we work with a small group of, of artists uh, for long periods of time. They're friends, they're like family. And um, it's really a pleasure to see how this kind of relationship develops and builds up. And um, it's really, really wonderful. Um, so what we try to do is um, we work with uh, local, with the, the local Israeli art scene and a lot with the international art scene. And uh, I think Israeli art is interesting. It's, it's incredible. And through the years, we see more and more and more uh, interest from the international scene in what is happening here. More and more Israeli artists are exhibiting abroad and uh, it really opens up, um, which is wonderful and I, I love it. What else can I tell you about the gallery? We work with international artists that we exhibit here. We work with Israeli artists that of course we exhibit here also but we have, uh, uh, using our uh, wide range of connections, if it was art fairs in the past and today, you know, COVID doesn't allow so many uh, um, venues to, to work, but uh, we work intensively with uh, people abroad. If it's images, if it's to the website, if it's uh, Instagram, if it's Facebook, and actually, it's nice to see how things shift to that direction. And we keep working, even though the pandemic uh, is difficult and hard. And, you know, I just talked today with a long uh, friend and collector who suffered some tra tragedies during the, co during the COVID and still, He's calling and, and he wants to see new things. And uh, I send him images and he replies. And uh, it's like a, like a getaway. 
It's wonderful. Celia. Celia. Well, we, I, Amnon, I can tell you that that um, we on our, our series have been interviewing um, scientists uh, uh, who are working on, on uh, vaccines and are working on uh, the medical aspects of, of this period, obviously. Um, but I, I think um, it's really important to acknowledge that, uh, that art has a role uh, to remind us of, of what it is we're living for. And indeed, uh, the con continuity of art uh, throughout uh, human history has really proven to be um, so important. And as I'm looking at, uh, you know, from our audience, people, the last time they did an art gallery was in Lyon, France, or was in uh, Quebec City seeing Picasso, uh, the, the uh, uh, Monet exhibit at the Art Institute of Chicago. You know, we, we really are have uh, uh, assembled today uh, uh, a group of people um, who, who need art in their lives. And, um, and indeed, Israeli art provides something that we think uh, the whole world needs to understand about Israel, to understand about Israelis. Uh, so let's start with Sigali and, and explore some of, uh, of, of your work. I, I know we have Sigali some images uh, from your your vast work, uh, from many different medium uh, that that you've worked with, and I, I I think it's best maybe just for you uh, to to introduce yourself and share a little bit about your journey as an artist because indeed uh, you've you've uh, you, you're trying new things all the time. You're you're if I could say shocking and 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 not. Uh, staying within the bounds of any specific expectation of an artist, uh, which I, I think is so needed during this period. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about your journey and uh, uh, what we're gonna see today. Hi, um, I do work with different mediums. It starts because when I graduated with it was the time of the installation art and I'm very much still an installation artist, which means that when I need to tell a story, I'll recruit and learn techniques and uh, work in various uh, mediums. By now, uh, video, of course, is uh, one thing that I do, and working in the Dead Sea is another thing, which is it's another um, very specific type of uh, work, which uh, um, in doing in the last 15 years. So I'll show a little bit of my work in the Dead Sea. Um, I'm, if you ask me what I am, I'm a sculptress really. So this is my thing. If you give me like a space and um, if it's a, a building the story or a, a space which is a white cube, I will find a way to get my history, my family's history, the building, the the architectural story. So what we're seeing now, for instance, is um, it's kind of a nice clean cut example. When I was invited in 2011 um, to represent Israel in the Israeli pavilion. So I started uh, research about, I mean, how this pavilion came to be, what is, um, what was the process and uh, I was doing a kind of a ping pong between Tel Aviv and the Jakob Rechter's architecture, um, I knew because I had a big show in 2004 or five. That's also when I started to uh, experience, to shoot video in the Dead Sea. I did a kind of compared the, the pavilion that Helena Rubinstein uh, donated to the city of Tel Aviv, to the Tel Aviv Museum and uh, the building which is eventually built in Venice. Uh, Israel, Israel Pavilion was the last national pavilion to be built in the Giardini. We're looking now at a very unofficial part of it, which is um, a hole in the wall. And I dug up a place which is, uh, when you have levels and uh, Rechten really did the level, building a kind of a dynamic of a cluttered entrance, a bigger space that's more, um, heroic, like a 
like an altar and then a medium space. So under the medium, under the middle kind of story of the pavilion, I made a, a kind of a cave where I pumped water from the canal next to our pavilion. I brought it into the building. If you can progress, you will see I um, there's a whole system. So we have a pumping kind of heart and these are like the arteries. But these, these specific arteries for someone who knows Israel and also especially in the desert where these kind of um, devices are they're not so hidden. It's part of how um, uh, in Israel the, te the te inventing water out of uh, out of um, solid earth, brown desert land, pumping it on the very very deep one kilometer and a half down. So there'll be this is the aesthetics. Now, how come am I? Why did I do this? So every artist who was invited to our pavilion in Venice has to cope with this floor, with this entrance floor, and everybody does it differently. But if you see the real, there's a real um, pillar, and then there's the pipes. The pillars, which are also very typical of, of uh, this international style of the Zerecht uh, build with, kind of intuitively uh, in association, it's, it's, I went back and forth to a water device. This run on the, in this bit, in this first floor, which normally has windows. Here I blocked it, and you're in a, a machine room. From this machine room, um, you can the story goes. You know the plot thickens, and you're seeing a video on the floor, which it's going to be hard today to kind of tell the whole story. But it's really in the back. You look at the water meters, which are uh, super Israeli. To put your water meter in front of your of a, of a public house is okay when you're not trying to be over, you know, you have no time or interest in being super beautiful. We don't, our uh, water in our pipes doesn't, they don't freeze. So also Italians have water meters. Like I was in Venice and worked with a plumber who was local, but they'd be, for instance, hiding it in the, in the ground or in the back room. So I kind of, uh, it's kind of, you're going up these uh, stairs, they're a little bit odd, kind of spiraling stairs, and you're also climbing, I call them ladders, so they're water ladders. You can go on and see. Oh, the video on the floor, okay. Video on the floor, get a game. Game that children play, I think, through, I know, throughout the world, so there's something in games that are very, um, they have, they're to do with childhood, but they have there's also to do with a set of rules. The rules of this game and the, what you saw when you looked down at this video, um, it's called the knife game or territories. And you're supposed to kind of conquer land in, in a playful way and you're throwing a knife. So in the Hebrew, it's also called the knife game. You're throwing a knife, um, if it hits well, if, if you hit the, if it's like sticks well into the sand, if it's, you, may, you have the chance to draw a new border. And if you're not too greedy and you didn't throw your knife too far, you'll, you'll make your territory grow. So if you don't, you, of course, most of you have enough, connected enough to our culture and our politics, reality and our history to understand why this game was something that kind of uh, drew my, um, my interest, my attention. You can see the sea. So we're playing on a... It's called the Little Al, between solid land and, and sea. Here, the Mediterranean Sea, these three um, people are playing. I really wanted to, to create the game between um, uh, Palestinians in the Gaza and kids from Ashkelon, because Ashkelon is uh, the, the beach of Zikim, our neighbors. So it's kind of a to drop the, me the metaphor and, and cross borders and I ended up with a piece which is about borders. So it's one of my subjects, together with corporality and temporality. There's also a parallel video, a video which was while I was bored, <laughs> the boys were doing the boy game. I invented a dance where the girl, um, I, I worked with a group of dance, uh, dancers, 
so that came out from the water in a different video and kind of reach and throw like um, they like fall on the beach and using their hands rather than a knife and they draw kind of marks on the beach. So there's always uh, there's the main there's the leading reason why I come to a place and then there's the other things that happen while you're exploring. So it's also true about when I came in to the Dead Sea in 2004, um, a few months after the death of my mother. There I was, a young artist, invent, invited to for the to do a very very big show, and I um, actually after the big Alon Seged show in 2003, where Tel Aviv was the the focal point and the Intifada was going on, I did a show the show in the in the Tel Aviv museum was bringing my back, the back, um, inverting the periphery and my, the, where, the area where I grew up. And I grew up in Jerusalem, facing the eastward, the Dead Sea, the northeastern part of Jerusalem. And so we have more water meters. Once you climb there, there were two elements in the top floor. Whoever was there remembers, perhaps. There's a fishing net, which I brought from Jaffa, which obviously when I suspended it in the water of the Dead Sea, I didn't expect to catch any fish. I just catched a kind of a, a there was a crystallization process which I uh, studied carefully and I'm still learning more and more about. And uh, the crystals um, kind of, they el kind of eliminated, they transform the fishing net into something more uh, seen in maybe in Roman sculpture, like that kind of a fabric. Discrete, the, 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 the fishing net um, is kind of has time. It did, it did its time. Next to it, you saw the film, which was a very. It's, this is this film is called uh, Salted Lake. It's shot in uh, Gdansk, a city which was Danzig, which was turning hands between Germany and Poland. And the two shoes, they look huge in the frame because. Um, my partner, Yotam, uh, was shooting this video lying on, on a frozen lake, the shoes are on the ice. And um, because I did spend a lot of time in London, I lived in Philadelphia, I knew that salt and ice are have a certain chemistry. The chemistry being that these heavy um, crystallized uh, salt uh, boots are going to slowly burn their holes um, and they can't exist anymore on this uh, from this uh, strata. So stratas are all also connected very much to what this uh, space was about. In, the, in terms of architecture, my shoes were falling back down into the machine room. I need a, a circular story to work. Um, when you descended from that floor, which was more like went from the present to the, to the past, landing the, in, the, um, in the future. And in a, the future is a, is a child, and uh, the child is expecting um, the conference room to be a place where um, the conflict will be resolved, hopefully, one day. Um, what you actually saw was a, she was trying to tie laces of people who are not there. So it's really very, very multi-layered. So there's an empty table, a deserted table. The, the audience are the ones who are looking at the, the 12 laptops. The 12 laptops uh, were 12 different angles and the child was tying shoes of people who were, had no intention to stay in the negotiation table and they deserted and abandoned uh, the discussion barefoot like prisoners of war or like refugees. So it's kind of a contradiction going on and uh, here she is, thinking she was the mischievous, but actually it's not. It's the, her, her her plan didn't work, and the and the, the parties uh, didn't deliver. And we're still in the same place today in terms of uh, political situations. So politics comes through the, the front door or the back door. It's in my work always. Um, yeah, we have to move on. Um, here we are 
2014, I wanted to make to to, to uh, celebrate the cold peace with Jordan. So the, it was then that I realized that the same sea that I'm so busy um, making miracles and uh, metaphors is actually a real border. Why don't we sail across the sea? So it wasn't possible. We did a lot of uh, um, we, we attempted you know in every level. All we could do is sail across the sea and stop in, this, in a certain point where the, the borders meet. So the three entities, the three Jordan, the, the Jordan, Jordanians, the Palestinian authorities in, in Israeli territorial waters. But we're the, the group that um, sailed with us, it's a very diverse group. We're eating knafen, which came from Amman on that morning with a friend from Amman. So, Utopia or not utopia, there's something really concrete going on. And there's something in my process of dreaming of one day a bridge of salt or a bridge of a metaphoric bridge between the countries. Um, we actually realized that we're going to start building a bridge in the middle of the sea because nobody really wants to go along with us. It's not going to be that easy. Now, just if we can briefly, if that's okay. Um, two years ago, we kind of found ourselves wanting to do, instead of a big uh, exhibition, but summarize our experiences and the, the various projects um, since 2003, 4 until 2019 in a, in a book called Salt Years. And um, there's texts, there's uh, various um, texts, and curators and scientists scientific archaeologist writing there and a, a curator of the show in Salzburg, which was in the same year, and my text. Let's look a little bit, because what you don't see a lot of the times in an, in an exhibition is the process. So there's also the actual, this is the book. It turned out to be a 400-page book. It turned out to be not a, a small thing of a few months, but it took us more than two years to... to to perfect, designed by um, Michael Gordon, very, very famous and important uh, art book designer, art and architecture. So let's let's take a, a quick peek. So here you see uh, how we are actually t taking out uh, suspended in salt crystals. Um, what this object is in a postcard holder. So it's one of the first things I ever tried to do is crystallize a postcard uh, holder. So, you know, once once upon a time we had postcards and we sent them from our various places. Now we don't need them at all. So it's kind of a way to, to um, think about it. Now we're looking at a tutu dress, which is black. I was a dancer, very important. I came from dance. I was educated as a even a classical dancer. So expect the change of color, okay? And expect this very airy and, and, and uh, a kind of um, dreamy-like dress to transform. Transformation is also very much um, what my art is about, what I am about, here we are. So once it's together with this um, stretcher, which we also here have a photo of, actually, so this stretcher um, of a wounded, of a, of a deceased, the installation is called the de, like pas de deux. So we have a, a dancer and a, a not so dancer. My short but meaningful career also had to end due, due to injury. So there's always something very personal going on and also something very collective. So Israelis, we don't sometimes know the difference between the, the me and the, and the we. This is called When I Go, it's a cello. Um, it's a kind of a manipulated, a sculptured uh, stool, certain kind of a straw construction and a bride's veil. So it's another invitation. What um, your time took the photos, with, for the, especially for this book. This book was really um, it take it took us into side projects, and 
it looks like a gallery, but it's actually our studio in, um, in next to the Dead Sea in a kibbutz, um, not so far from Jerusalem. Um, so a whole half year of make, it's a nice concept. You make an installation, you shoot it, no opening, no audience, just make it and, and document it. It's really, really not so easy to shoot salt. It's a special kind of uh, material also, you know, hydrophilic. We have a whole, um, we have objects which are 15 year olds that are very much preserved in salt. Some also, sometimes we, I call them my sculptors cry. Post card holder. This is less, this is less time. There's different, different um, times going on here. There's one which has a very thin coat of crystal, salt crystals, and one, one which was like double the time when we're talking about weeks. So we're talking about maybe one month to three months in this, this specific uh, demonstration. Yeah, so then these installations were shown uh, in Salzburg just before the pandemic hit. So, and the museum had, uh, has two. It has an old building where I showed um, a selection of, vi of video works. It's called the Rupertino. And um, the new building where we showed the, the salt installations. So this space was, uh, it's called Litoral and it's more about fishing nets, but you can see the diff how, we, how it evolved and how we, we, get, we kind of learn and get to master it and they look different and they look really better. Sigalit, can I, can I ask you just um, as we're looking at these particular pieces that um, uh, are made from art, could you just describe a little bit of the process? How does that work to, to actually shape around? Uh, I think of it as being brittle, uh, uh, the salt. How do, you, how do you actually make it sort of um, uh, informed in such, such a uh, representational way? Um, so this is a kind of, when we started, when I chose to, to um, make work in the Dead Sea, I thought I was there for just once, one summer to make the videos I needed for the show in, in the pavilion um, of the Tel Aviv Museum. But then while I worked, I realized that there's no, I don't need to do very much because it's a, it's, a, it's a natural phenomena. So we do, we do work in the Southern Basin of the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea, which is evaporating gradually um, it's harder and harder to access them. So we overcome, let's say you, once you overcome and you reach the water, um, it's actually sort of taking an object, which means um, experimenting with different ideas, but choosing and putting it in now uh, in a certain way uh, in a certain time of year, in a certain um, hot, in hot, the hot weather. And then kind of visiting it and editing it slightly, but there's, there's, it's a kind of a, it's work in nature. It's work in, it's, it's land art, but the land is salty. It's a tearful, and it's like, it's a, it's a living metaphor. It's really a very, very special, as most of you probably know. Um, so yeah, the process is, coming prepared and being able to access like when the crack of dawn, we're there to look after things and to decide uh, when it's really the moment that it leaves the room and comes into the studio and is treated, dried and, and composed into installations. Well, I, I'm so amazed by the connection between the landscapes and the pieces that you've created, which it sounds like um, date to your childhood and uh, as well as your, you know, contemporary uh, 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 surroundings. And um, I, I, I want to, I have so many questions that I want to ask you and, and uh, um, I can almost taste the kanafe in the ocean. I've never done that before. <laughs> Uh, so thanks for uh, adding some sweet with the salt as well. Um, Gideon, um, I'd love to uh, um, uh, compliment uh, the, the virtual exhibit uh, with, with your work. Um, 
that uh, is is so evocative and so um, uh, dramatic in, in in the work. And I'd love for you to just share a little bit about your journey and and um, your very unique style of of, of painting, which um, you know we're going to show some examples of it. Per, but perhaps first you could introduce sort of how how you started there, and then we'll we'll come back and open up for discussion with Unknown and Sigali. Sure. Um, thanks for that. Um, well, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll say a few words and just give a kind of a background. Um, I mean, as uh, I was uh, yeah, born in Israel, um, and I've actually um, kind of left Israel, um, or haven't really left, but started traveling right after the army, kind of a very natural uh, backpacking trip that uh, a lot of my peers have done. Um, and as I uh, traveled, I very uh, surprisingly found painting. Um, so I would always say that I'm, I'm a painter, first and foremost. Um, by that, I mean my, my material is paint. Um, I paint on canvas, the more traditional way. And I paint on, on magazines, on old newspapers, or even on cardboards. Hmm. In my work, I deal with the subjects such as, uh, especially such as history, uh, memory. I've always been a portrait painter, um, photography, questions of representation, uh, perhaps even, um, perhaps even erasure, and and art history. I guess those would be the probably main main things. Um, I'm also, uh, I guess, one of the things that I took from my parents' home, which if anyone have been there would have known, it looks like a jumble sale of the British Museum. I'm a collector. I want to say collector, but I'd probably say hoarder is a, is a better phrase to describe myself. Um, and I like things. I, I can almost hear their story. I'm always intrigued by things. I think I think I'll probably, if I wouldn't be an artist, I'll probably be an antique dealer or um, have an antique shop somewhere. Um, I mean, my influences are kind of quite varied and they move around. So, um, as I mentioned, it could be art history books, it could be collections, it could be things I see, um, Objects I collect, films. Um, I'm as much influenced by by Leonard Cohen than Hemingway, or even a Bialik poem, or um, you know a, a Russian film, or an you know, Andrei Tarkovsky mirror, or uh, one car why the mood for love. So so it, I kind of I'm a scavenger. I I just get whatever I can. Maybe that's part of the fact that I kind of travel and I and I never sit still. Um, I thought probably the the, the two, uh, two two anecdotes, two interesting stories would be um, first would be to describe kind of a little bit of the uh, I, uh, the art residency. So part of the way I travel constantly is um, I experience places by by taking um, art residencies. I've done it in Tel Aviv, I've done it in China, I've done it in Italy, and in those places I just come, I sit down, and I start. Um, I start looking at the past of the place, and I think that's where I, I can understand it a little bit more. When I came to Tel Aviv, I had uh, these ideas. I've never majorly worked in Tel Aviv or painted in Israel at all, and that's to do probably maybe a little bit with my family history. But I came to Tel Aviv for a residence in Bialik Street of all places, just opposite where um, my father was born. And I think the first thing I... I uh, I planned was to work perhaps with the family, with the images of, of my family, but I always feel comfortable and work with anonymous images and that did not work well. So after a day or two, um, I kind of gave up on, on, on the family issue and went to sit in a little cafe in Geula Street, uh, quite depressed and not knowing what to do. Uh, and by chance there was um, a little shop there of, of old magazines, 50s or, or uh, 50s, 60s gossip magazines, like Isha or Haolam Azir and all kinds of stuff like that. And, um, and I acquired a few of the magazines, again, in order, as, as an object, in order to take that as a, as a source material, as an inspiration. Um, at the end of that day, I just kind of just painted some kind of, a, just, just painted out of, you know, 
kind of just out of nothing, out of reflex on the magazine. And the next day I came in, it was kind of a little eureka moment. Uh, and I was like, oh, that could work. I always wanted to work with text. I never knew how to, but to erase text or to paint over text, it was, um, it was really what, uh, what got me going. From that, uh, I went to another residency in China, and there I found, uh, through my wife, who is Chinese, uh, magazines that were published before the Cultural Revolution, called Huabao, and I painted on those. And that was kind of uh, pretty much um, a kind of museum tour that I had in San Jose in California, in Herzliya Museum in, in, um, in Israel, in Changdu Museum, where I painted, uh, where I showed these magazines, these kind of old time capsules of magazines, which I altered and painted over. Um, going to the image that you all see now, um, and that's and also to do with the magazines. Um, so at the time I'm working with magazines and it's um, the Freud house, the Sigmund Freud's house, um, is very near to where I live in London. It's about a 10 minute walk, which I happen to visit quite often because um, it's magical. And I uh, recommend if you haven't been. At that visit, uh, which was kind of a couple of years ago, I remember wondering, um, about the time uh, Freud uh, left Vienna, ran away from Vienna, uh, pre, uh, just in the last moment before the Second World War. And, and the thought that stayed in my head was, what kind of magazine must have they seen um, on the newsstand when they fled, uh, fled uh, through Paris and to London? Um, obviously, I wasn't, um, I did, I wasn't interested in the magazines with the war. With that, I, I think I could imagine it quite well. But I wanted to acquire a few of those magazines. The first thing I did was contact my uh, gallery in Cologne, which kind of freaked out. And they were like, look, uh, we, this is we can't help you with. Um, there is advantages of having a Chinese wife who doesn't know the intricacies and delicacies and little sensitivities of uh, my side of the world. And she was like, no problem. I'll get it to you uh, through eBay. Miraculously, a week or two later, we got this kind of package of old German magazines. Um, so if you could think of those 50s magazines I was painting before, now I'm looking at well, German-Austrian magazines from the 30s. Um, some of them had Nazi um, images within it or uh, photographs of Hitler, etc. And uh, the Nazi march marching. Some of it was just seemed very, um, well, mundane, if you can say that. Um, it was a very much, uh, how would I say, it was, I was pushed away and repulsed by the subject matter and the material, but at the same time, I was pulled to it um, physically. So even though I didn't want to do it, I got up in the next day, I got there, I kind of opened the magazine in within the studio and just started painting on it. What was very apparent from the beginning, it was darker than those magazines from before. And... Um, it got me. It got me interested. Got me going. Um, as as often it happens to me, some you kind of tick something. You open a little uh, rabbit hole, and then all of a sudden a flood comes in. And I was just painting and painting and painting it more. Um, people came into the to the studio. I used it also. I, I used these these kind of a source materials for paintings that I make afterwards. Um, kind of the reception it got and I could see that it moves people uh, quickly I managed um, a curator from the Freud Museum came over he liked the work he proposed they got it and, and uh, we were doing the show we had a, kind of a date and I was progressing with the work as I worked through it there was one thing I really wanted to do was do go visit Vienna I've never been to Vienna and I wanted to see uh, Freud's house and also some Schiele and some uh, Klimt <laughs> um, so a very quick visit to Vienna and um, um, as we come back, I fly back with, uh, with my wife, with Celia, and I asked her, I said, look, you know, I've kind of finished those magazines, the German magazines. Can you get me some more? I think I mentioned something like, you know, get me those great ma images you had uh, uh, with some Hitler and some this and, and, and kind of, well, and kind of Berlin, etc. cetera. Uh, a week or two later, miraculously, a knock on the door, Amazon delivery, and I get this package. And if we can go back to those images of the Black Book, um, and then as I, um, as, as I, as I open the, the, these, these books, I, I tell my, uh, I freeze and I'm, I'm, I say to, I say to her, I'm saying, uh, you didn't get me magazines. You got me Mein Kampf. And it was in the morning. This was a Mein Kampf in English translation. I've never touched the Mein Kampf. I've never actually seen one in reality. Um, 
my girls, I, I didn't know what to do with it. My initial thing was just to put it in the bin. But that would be, meant that it would be left there for the rest of the day. So I thought, um, I kind of read, the, my, our girls started to ask, Daddy, what did mommy got you? And I said, I said and, and she didn't even know what she got me. She was, what, what's mine come? It was too early in the morning before school to even go into it. I just took it to the studio and hid it somewhere. And again, the next day I came back and very reluctantly, I took it and started painting it in black, the cover. There's only one example here of that. Um, but it was 18 booklets of this English translations of Mein Kampf that was published in England in 1930s. And I eventually, after six months, covered every single word or every single uh, letter within that. Um, it was different because it had images. And that was the kind of heart of the Black Book exhibition within the Freud Museum. Um, with these images, I, um, to make things a bit lighter, I mean, and even in my cardboards, uh, my cardboard images, I came from art history books or reference could be a Velasquez painting in the Prado or, uh, or a Rembrandt or even um, Caravaggio. Um, and at the same time, Hello Magazine and Kate Moss or uh, any kind of gothic magazines that you'll find. So the first initial series was, was, met, was called From Goya to Paris Hilton. But 15 years later, I'm still continuing it. I've just showed a series of uh, these little cardboards in a gallery in Milan, and it was acquired by the Maramote Museum. Um, yeah, so, so that's, um, that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of my oeuvre and what I do. Um, that's an example of an exhibition I've had at Alon Segev Gallery. I think worth mentioning is um, I'm, if I would have been a musician, I would probably be performing every day. I'm not sure why, but it answers to some kind of need I have. So I do a lot of shows. I, am, I'm, I, I work constantly. I'm an obsessive worker, obsessive on other things as well. Um, and I think, um, and probably being asked, I, I imagine this question will come about the, the kind of faceless. Before that, I was painting portraits. I was, uh, b before 2001, when I was studying in SVA, I was painting from life. Um, being a son in a family of, well, art is, is kind of a subject matter within, within the family. I wanted to learn how to paint. I didn't, when I got to SVA in 96, I wasn't interested in anything. I just wanted to learn how to paint. Um, and I was painting figuratively, very from observation, very influenced by, by um, probably old masters and, and people like Lucian Freud. That's probably part of the reason why I ended up in Europe. But between the two schools, between the years of SVA and Slade, I happened to be in New York on September 11. And from that, which I won't go too much into it, started this kind of process where I've become more interested in erasing, where I've become more interested in abstraction within the kind of description and presentation. I guess in a way that's why I'm, I'm in love with painters like Morandi, um, because for me art is, is a lot about when things touch each other. And that's, uh, yeah, that's the uh, Caravaggio to Beyonce uh, series. And there's Beyonce right after uh, Caravaggio. These were, um, these paintings specifically at Alonso uh, Gallery were made from these German magazines. So what was, what I was interested in was how these little images from a paper how can they interact? How can they switch? How we move very quickly? I mean, how can one thing with a very careful editing and minute changes within details can become something quite different? I'm very much interested in that and how not only paint shifts, but subject matter. So these are pretty much images taken from 1930s uh, Germany, for all we know, but they could be from a kibbutz in 1950 or uh, China in 1970. And this painting is from my next exhibition um, at Alon Segev Gallery, which will open in September, which I hope I'm going to get there, but now I kind of doubt it. And it's um, a two-person exhibition with a painter called Duncan Hanna, who is um, a New York painter, Definitely not my kind of my generation. He was in the Warhol uh, 
factor even, um, a writer, um, a very sp special uh, person, which uh, and a painter, of course, which I've uh, got to, uh, well, I haven't met him, but got to know through, uh, well, Instagram or something like that, or online, uh, because of the pandemic. We exchange works, and um, I've invited him to do an exhibition with uh, with me at the Lonsegev Gallery. Um, and that's a two, uh, yeah, that will, and it's uh, called Hannah Rubin. And I, I hope if you do get to Tel Aviv in September or October, please do get, uh, please do come by and have a look. And oh, check we, out the we, shop. we hope to be there for sure in September, October. Mm. So uh, um, we very much look forward to that opportunity. Gideon, it's so interesting uh, to hear your description of your work in terms of being a time capsule and seeing um, the interaction between uh, Europe and, in, and popular culture and your own roots uh, in Israel is really just a, 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 a fascinating form of, of storytelling. I'm not, I'm, uh, as I think about both Sigalit and, and Gideon's work, uh, they both uh, have, have been very clear about their uh, connection with history and obviously their um, uh, as storytellers in different medium and different uh, uh, the journeys that they've been on with their travels as well as what they see happening. Um, it, it, is there a distinct element of Israeli art, do you think, that, that deals with history and memory uh, in, in this way and, and um, that, that, that you uh, can see or is... Uh, really uh, like the rest of Israeli society, there's so much going on. There's so, so many culture, language, history, memory uh, that's at play. Um, it, 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 when you exhibit, for example, in the gallery with other uh, um, contributors from other parts of the world, is it very clear which artists are the Israeli artists in, in, in your gallery? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's it's a it's a tough question, I think, because uh, Israel being uh, uh, like a constructed from so many uh, uh, places, so many different people uh, from so many countries, all packed together in a small country. Everybody is influencing everybody. You have art history. You have daily life, you have uh, the city, you, you have history, sometimes the uh, um, religion. Uh, Israel is so filled with all these people, times, history, future, diversity of cultures that I think it's hard for me to say that there is something that I can regard as specific Israeli in art. Uh, except for maybe the diversity of influences and arts and artistic languages. Uh, I think that sometimes you see an artist from LA and you can guess, yeah, he's from LA, he's from London, he's from Paris. And then you get to Israeli art and I think most of the time you can't tell uh, where they're from or if they're Israelis or not. Uh, I think Maybe there can be a hint when you look at painters. I think uh, the uh, Israeli light is very bright, and it's a very it's a rather warm country. It's a it's a desert, and when you see you see the color that painters use in Israel, you can feel the the, the warmth, the, the brightness. Uh, you see a lot of you don't you don't see, you see a lot of grays you see you see you see it's hot here well but uh, except for that uh, it's an interesting question maybe maybe sigalit who works in israel a lot and have a different idea um, or, or gidi israeli artist lives in london for many years but he is part of Israel, yeah. what do you think? I think I think if I can step in, I think for when I when when this question is up, I, I think of when I think of my own work, my own painting. I don't I don't think it is, it doesn't. Well, 
I don't think it is Israeli in that sense. I think the subject matter, the kind of references, what you say, the kind of influences is definitely. And I'm al- I will always, although I'm British as well, I will always be an Israeli. Uh, but in terms of the painting itself, but I don't paint in Israel at all. So I think a kind of I, I find myself the roots of painting in a more European tradition. Uh, something interesting that I'm thinking that I remember uh, Sigalicho, a country very, very well, although it was quite a young artist at the time. But I think what's, what's amazing in that is that when you do take a local story, something that's quite specific to the place, and in that show, it speaks to everyone. It becomes, it leaves that, it leaves that specific place. It leaves that being Israeli and becomes international and speaks to, doesn't necessarily need to come to, come from Israel to understand that work. I think that's something that I thought about um, with that. And, and I find it very, very true to, so, so, so there is, and it's true to music as well. I don't need to understand Paolo Conte. I don't need to understand Italian in order to, to, to kind of get the song somehow and and that's i think it's um, it's a true quality of, of something that's uh, quite great in art how it kind of transfers and how it mutates and how it could speak to many many languages in a different way sigalit i would love to to hear your your um uh perspective on what it means to be an israeli artist but in particular i was so struck in a number of your uh works by this sort of playful quality uh, that you um, brought through on very difficult topics. Uh, so you found a children's game that dealt with borders and you found the young girl under the table with her disappointment about the negotiations happening above, but being a little mischievous and, and uh, playing her own game beneath that. And the installations that perhaps other Europeans might just walk by on the uh, water installations, you turn that into a piece of, of curiosity and contemplativeness in the settings that you were operating in. Is, that, is there something about that irony that, I, that it's a different kind of humor, a different kind of uh, looking below the surface uh, to find some humor and, and ways to laugh at very, very challenging and difficult situations? Um, I wonder if there's something distinctly Israeli about that. There's something distinctly Jewish between the very apocalyptic and tragic and trying to find humor. Um, we share a local art history, so yes, we have these roots and then you really can, you can run, but you can't hide. And it's there and it's, it's an enriching specific uh, bubble and you kind of have one foot in where, where your uh, heart is and where you're, maybe where you're physically are, but that's the thing about art that it tries to transcend and it tries to to um, to have a di- to have a dialogue and it's and I think there's also so much good new younger artists who are you can see that they're uh, you know living in a very informed world even easier you know than in my days in art school you had to sit in the library and read a magazine and then you know make sure everybody in the critique knew that you read the magazine of what is going on in uh, in New York at the time, but when I was in the Cooper Union, uh, studying under Hans Hake in an exchange scheme with um, with Stalin and the Cooper Union, I had uh, fellow students who said, oh, I can't go to the river step with me because I can't, I can't see it all, okay? So uh, there's something very, very hungry and thirsty for us, to, like feeling experiencing periphery, needing to know everything and being, be every, you know, travel as Israelis do and as Jews do and uh, having less of a uh, pictorial tradition uh, the, the, in general the Jewish people more a verbal culture more um, abstract kind of uh, you know, at, at the time when everybody was religious we did not we were not supposed to make uh, a sculpture make images that was something that was the, the the, the Gentiles. This is all over now. It's now it's about you know the person constructing in a post postmodern and post secular identity of who I am as, as an individual and you know what kind of art everybody can you can decide you know you can, 
also um, there's a the chameleon thing. I never I never uh, hide my being Israeli, but I'm also look at my you know my parents were immigrants. They came in the 50s and 60s. So somebody like me would try very hard to be Israeli, but I have an English accent in my Hebrew, and Hebrew accent, eh, I'm British as well. You know, Viennese via my grandparents have a similar uh, and that also connection with, with Anna Frank uh, for Eden. There's a home nice, you know, it's a nice, it's a nice, messy, very exciting place to see and do art, I think, Israel as a as a as a base. Now that we can't travel all over, <laughs> you know. I think some of us are about to explode because so much of our being here is dependent on our also being, you know, you know, running around and being in other places to to, to inform ourselves and to, to feel that we belong in, in this sphere of visual art. Well, at, at the moment, uh, many of us are not able to run around. And so we are living vicariously through your art and Gideon and Sigalit, uh, uh, you have been so generous in sharing not only the images that we got to look at today, um, but about your processes and about your thinking about your work and your identities and how it connects uh, to uh, works that are, are enjoyed and contemplated and shared um, in, in Israel and, and indeed around the world. And we're, we're, we're really grateful for that. This hour has sped by incredibly fast. I have so many additional questions and questions from the audience I would love uh, to cover. Uh, so Amnon, we may have to do a, uh, you know, a, 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 a follow-up episode one day to see what they're, just by what they're working on now is what uh, frankly, I'm, I'm most curious and because uh, uh, indeed, um, we we need you. We need your creative spirit and creative insights, and uh, to help, I think, um, uh, understand this period as well as get through this period. But but the insights from uh, artists and from Israel, I think, in particular, Israeli uh, uh, artists and in, in the roots of of uh, of of this. Um, a creative moment um, are really going to be uh, needed for us to understand and process indeed what it's been like. So for now, uh, uh, I, 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 unfortunately, we don't have more time today, but I just want to thank Amnon and Sigalit and Gideon for uh, being with us and, and, and sharing from the Alon Segev Gallery. We're here every Wednesday and Sunday since uh, the beginning of this miserable period of, of COVID. We know it's been like this up and down and We've all been like that on the inside as well on the exterior, but please come and join us on Wednesdays and Sundays. We'll be back on Sunday with a great program about Israeli guide dogs who understand Hebrew probably uh, as well or better than I do. And so uh, uh, we'll continue our series all through the summer. We've got some great concerts. We have some great um, uh, creations of uh, uh, Israeli artists and Israeli uh, innovators. So please come and join us. And uh, we want to wish everyone a safe and happy week. Thanks again to all our friends uh, in Israel and Gideon. And, Thank and you. Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you for this.